Hello, I am John D. Ruddy and welcome to my channel. If you haven't already, please subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this. Ever since the end of the Lord of the Rings film trilogy and the massive success that it was, there were always the rumours of when will they make The Hobbit? Let's go back to the mid-2000s. Return of the King has just come out. In fact, Return of the King has just won like 12 Oscars. And we're waiting for... In fact, then we fl flash forward and we get the extended edition of Return of the King. This is the final hurrah of the Lord of the Rings. And then people go their separate ways. Peter Jackson and his gang, they all go on to make King Kong. But... Ever since the end of the Lord of the Rings film trilogy and the massive success that it was, there were always questions of when will they make The Hobbit? Fan casting of Martin Freeman floated around the internet long before any film was in the works. I remember checking the OneRing.net every day while I was in university for updates. It just became a little daily habit of the OneRing.net. Oh, they've casted this person. Or, you know, it was even before casting, it was just rumors. Rumors grew of a shadow in the east, whispers of a nameless fear. Rumblings of Guillermo del Toro getting involved. And all that came with it, the prospect of his love of practical effects and creatures who might his go-to actors play, thoughts of Ron Perlman for Bayorn, for example. As the prospect developed, it hit some major stumbling blocks along the way, initially being the film rights belonging to various companies. One of which being MGM, which was going through a financial crisis at the time. Hey, so is everybody. It was 2008 or 2009 or whatever year it was, but it was around then when everyone was like, yay, economy. For better detail on this, and indeed a much better series of videos on The Hobbit, check out Lindsay Ellis's Hugo-nominated duology of three on the topic. It's, it's probably down there. Eventually, word came that Del Toro would no longer be working on the project. The official line was that he had various projects lined up after The Hobbit, and the longer the delay in production went on, the more that they would eat into his later projects. Fair enough. The road not travelled is often pondered over. What would a Lord of the Rings movie starring the Beatles have looked like? Would Justice League have been any less of a train wreck had Zack Snyder been allowed to cut it? Well, I guess the world got an answer to that one. When it comes to the Hobbit trilogy, many often wonder what the Hobbit may have looked like if it had been directed by Guillermo del Toro. Would his fresh approach and whimsical style have brought The Hobbit the critical acclaim its big brother Lord of the Rings achieved? Or might his style have been at odds with what had already been established in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy? Who knows? Del Toro's version of The Hobbit is one of the greatest speculative movies never made. Right up there with what if Steven Spielberg had directed Return of the Jedi? because that's a thought. Some other rumors, I I do remember back when this was still kind of quite fresh, uh, Del Toro leaving, was I do remember at the time there were rumors of a conversation between Guillermo Del Toro and James Cameron. Cameron suggesting that Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth and indeed The Hobbit might still be Peter Jackson's baby. But... You know, of course, paraphrasing, of course. Many reckoned that Peter Jackson would naturally fill the void in the director's chair, although according to the appendices of The Hobbit films, he was a lot more hesitant about it. Long story short, though, he had already made a massive Middle Earth movie trilogy. Ooh, alliteration. And he, he knew how crazy and how insane and how difficult that would be to do it again, or at least it was only two movies this time. 
never know. <laughs> we know it's a trilogy, <laughs> go on. Uh, uh, but so he knew what was in front of him. But long story short though, Peter Jackson took the job and all seemed well again. It was looking like the old band was getting back together with pretty much everyone involved in the production of Lord of the Rings. They were on board with The Hobbit. Jackson wasn't able to work with what Del Toro had developed already. Del Toro had been in New Zealand for a long time developing this project, and Peter Jackson wasn't then able to just take those designs and those developments and just run with it. He couldn't just work with someone else's vision, for various creative reasons. So Jackson and his team essentially had to redesign the entire film, or two films. It was it was it was going to be two films. That's that's important. I even remember there was speculation for a while that the first film would just be The Hobbit, and the second film would be some Middle Earth movie to bridge the gap. This this illustrious bridge movie. <sighs> Thank God that didn't happen. Sorry, Cliff, but it wouldn't work as a standalone film. Maybe as a miniseries, yeah, but. Not as an awkward bridge movie. It's, no. <laughs> After several more massive hurdles, such as a union dispute with the New Zealand and Australian Actors Guild, again, see Lindsay Ellis's video. She does an excellent job at exploring this. And Peter Jackson being hospitalized with a perforated ulcer just weeks before the production. Eventually, the production got underway in March 2011. Oh my god. That was 10 years ago. Oh, <laughs> wow, I feel old, I remember this, oh man, and I know how people feel whenever I tell them that I was like 12 years old watching the first Lord of the Rings movie, and like, you know, the, the, the older generation of fans are just like, oh man, I, like I was an adult, whereas I was an adult when all of the Lord of the Rings was happening, ah, uh, anyway. The circle is now complete. Different. Different series, John. I remember watching the first production diary video that Peter Jackson released on YouTube. No, it didn't come out on YouTube first. It came out on Facebook. He released it on Facebook. And then eventually they started releasing them on, uh, on YouTube as well. Oh, I watched those videos over and over again, taking screenshots, dissecting everything in the background, trying to work out what was going on and who was what, and you know, just picking up every single clue, doing essentially what the internet does best. I still have two photo albums on Facebook called Hobbit Excitement. And there were two albums because this was so long ago that this was back when they had to limit the amount of photos you could put in a Facebook album. This was also when people were putting photos in photo albums on Facebook. <laughs> Instead of like, you know, sharing conspiracy theory videos. <laughs> Yay, social media! I remember being on holiday in Italy when they began releasing the first photos of the dwarves. I remember specifically watching the second production diary in a hostel in Venice. You know, it's funny just remembering what was going on in my life while all of this was happening down in New Zealand. I remember speculating where they might split the story between the two films. I figured the end of film one would be after Out of the Frying Pan Into the Fire, because Bayorn would act as a really solid place to open the second film and recount a bit of the story, you know, as they all come in and say, hey, so this is what we're doing so far. Turns out I got it both right and wrong at the same time. At San Diego Comic Con 2012, do you remember Comic Con? At San Diego Comic Con 2012, The Hobbit owned Hall H. And yes, I pronounce it H. That's what we do in Ireland. It's, it's H. It's not H, it's H. Because it's. it's ha, ha. Anyway, you know, The Hobbit owned Hall H. And, you know, at least from my Hobbit-obsessed perspective at the time. 
They had a whole panel, a preview reel, a massive extended poster bringing us through the unexpected journey of film one, going all the way up to barrels out of bond. Hmm. Cool choice. Also, I love this image of Gandalf and Bayorn. I wish they had have stuck with this design. It's wonderful, it's beautiful, and it's straight out of the book. At this time, there were rumors circling about a third film. I think maybe more so it was just fans wanting a third film, because, you know, more, please. There's even a funny in hindsight moment in one of the production diaries where Peter Jackson and Andy Serkis joke about how it was taking them longer to shoot two films than it had taken them to shoot the Lord of the Rings trilogy. About halfway through our location shoot, first and second units met up and it happened to be exactly halfway through the entire shoot, day 127, and we commemorated that with a hoodie, a halfway hoodie. But it's 127 days and uh, it's two films. Now, well, I've got 133 day Lord of the Rings ah, yes. jumper, which was for three films. Yes. So 133 days for three films yes. and 127 days for two films. Yes, easy, easily explained. How? Well, we're all 10 years older, so we're going a little slow. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. All rumours were denied at Comic-Con, but by the end of that month, it was announced. Most reactions were, yes, more Hobbit. But those wiser looked at the length of the book and indeed the structure of the plot and thought, okay, hmm, like, like Lord of the Rings is like this and The Hobbit is like this and three films, two films. Like, mm, mm. I mean, obviously there was a ton cut out of Lord of the Rings, but... Hmm. I feel thin, stretched like butter scraped over too much bread. Behind the scenes, what had happened was after a year and a half of hectic principal photography, around May 2012, Peter Jackson decided to not shoot the climactic Battle of the Five Armies until pickups in 2013. Principal photography ended at the start of July 2012, and by the end of that month, Peter Jackson revealed publicly that The Hobbit was becoming a trilogy. The official reason given was that there was much more story to tell and characters to develop. Given how thinly stretched the third film ultimately felt, you know, whenever it was finally released a couple of years later, and other structural problems that this caused throughout the trilogy, I don't think that this was the case. And I would imagine the writing team behind the multi-award winning Lord of the Rings trilogy may have also been aware of this. One detail that came to light from a lawsuit between Harvey Weinstein Ugh. and Warner Brothers, in which Weinstein was trying to get his royalties from films two and three, was that films two and three focused more on the dwarves and any other character other than Bilbo in order to argue that these adaptations didn't exclusively follow the adventures of Bilbo. Therefore, Weinstein wasn't entitled to a cut of films two and three. Because Weinstein would get his cut of the profits of the first film, Warner Brothers wanted to maximize their earnings, thus film two became film two and film three. It's cynical as hell, but that's Hollywood. I mean, you know, it's, it's called the movie industry for a reason. It's all about the money. My theory for years was that either one of two things happened. Either A, Peter Jackson knew he couldn't bluff his way through shooting a complex battle sequence, so he requested extra pickup time to regroup. The studio agreed, but told him he was making a third movie too. Or B, Peter Jackson knew he needed the time, but rather than approaching the studio with a problem, he approached them with a solution. A third film. 
either option makes a lot more sense than looking at the final films that were made and the, you know, we have so much story to tell. I don't think so, guys. There were many factors in the duology becoming a trilogy. Peter Jackson hadn't had the prep time he'd had for Lord of the Rings. Once principal photography got up and running and the first few weeks of carefully planned sequences were shot, Peter Jackson was winging it, which he has openly admitted to. When you're going onto a set, very complicated, and you're winging it, you've got nothing to go on, no storyboards, no previews, you've got these massively complicated scenes and you're just making it up there and then on the spot. The whole production winged it. I mean, they did it professionally and in many ways miraculously, but they were laying down the tracks as the train was rushing up behind them. It is a testament to their work that these films managed to be made as well as they were. Within the storytelling, up until the Battle of Five Armies, the films were relatively straightforward. Most action sequences were travelling from point A to point B. Dialogue scenes were fairly clear cut from a storytelling perspective, and thus were wingable by a very experienced director and production team. You know, the action scenes were, like say Goblin Town, they have to go from point A to point B and in the middle and in between there's a roller coaster of craziness. But here, here, happy days. The spiders, they're lost, spiders, elves find them. You know, it's, it's very straightforward. Barrels, they get in the barrels, they go down the river, away they go, they literally follow the river. But you know, all of those sequences are straightforward. All of the um, character scenes are, okay, we need to do this. Okay, are you okay with this? And you know, like they're very straightforward. But once you get to the Battle of the Five Armies, it's complex, it's, it's insane. As they knew from their experience, shooting and editing the Battle of Helm's Deep and the Battle of Pelennor Fields, a sequence as complex as the Battle of Five Armies could not be bluffed. It needed to be carefully planned, and thus more time was needed. This also explains why the final battle, which was shot during pickups of 2013, was so green screen heavy. Having green screen orcs, particularly Azog, allowed them to keep orc design options open, not having to lock down and commit to final designs on set. Design teams could continue to design and perfect their creatures all through 2013 and 2014. Azog is a particularly interesting piece to this puzzle. I remember back in 2012, while I was still trying to piece together what this film would be, I saw production photos of Conan Stevens playing Azog in a big beastly beard practical orc outfit. It was, it was out there, but it did look really cool. And I was intrigued to this new design aesthetic. As the film approached, it was announced that this beardy dude would now be Balg and not Azog. Okay, cool. I mean, he, he was on some of the early posters. It was looking like he was going to be a big deal. In December 2012, as we all collectively worried about the end of the world. Yeah, remember that was the thing in December 2012? <sighs> I was so excited about the release of The Hobbit. I was so excited that I hopped on a plane to London and stood at the side of the green carpet. It was green, it wasn't red. They had a green carpet that was really cool. At the Leicester Square premiere and shook hands with everyone. It was such a great night. For me, it felt like, I'm not much of a sports fan, but this was kind of the closest I have ever felt to going out and supporting my team, was going out and cheering on all of the people as they were coming past. And it was really nice because a lot of people who were at the premiere were, 
you know, they were just there because, as I discovered, there are people who just go to premieres as a hobby and every week they're like, oh, you know, they, they just, it's their hobby to go and get autographs and to get photos with celebrities. It's a really cool subculture. I thought this was great. But for me, like, I knew all of the actors playing the dwarf. I mean, I didn't know them personally, but I knew who they were and I knew who they were playing. And so, uh, so it was lovely. I was, oh, that's Graham McTavish. Oh, that's Stephen Hunter, you know. And um, and I remember just asking them, like, you know, sh shaking their hands. Like, I wasn't interested in getting autographs. I just wanted to shake their hands. And, and, I, and I remember asking them, are you having a good night? And they were like, yeah, do you know what? This is great. You know, it was, I was just, I was so happy for them. And I was so pleased, particularly for a lot of the actors who were, you know, unknowns. Particularly a lot of the Kiwi actors. But, you know, this was a massive moment for them. And probably is going to have been the biggest moment for some of their careers. So it was wonderful to see them. I remember as well, there was this wonderful moment where Andy Serkis was right in front of me and Bernard Hill, who played Théoden in Lord of the Rings, they clearly hadn't seen each other in ages. And they had just this wonderful embrace right in front of me. I was like, this is, this is wonderful. I love this. It was such a good night. I even met with Jimmy Nelson but hopping out for a wee sneaky fig. Obviously, I didn't have tickets to the premiere that night, but I did go see the film the very next morning in the BFI on IMAX. And I was tucked down in the front corner. I was really tired and really nervous. <laughs> you know, it, was, it reminded me a little bit of uh, that wonderful moment at the end of Fanboys, where they've been waiting for so long for... Uh, uh, Phantom Menace to come out and literally as the titles are going just before uh, you know as the 20th Century Fox logo is going they just one of them says what if it sucks and I was just like Ugh. something that I always do at the start of any movie where I'm kind of going and going oh I hope this is good I hope this isn't I you know I, I hope this isn't bad I hope this isn't Spider-Man 3 um, and I always <laughs> I always am brought back to the end of Black Adder Goes Forth, where they're all ready to go up over the trenches, and I just, just as as the as the lights go down, and I'm just like, good luck everyone, you <laughs> know, just like before seeing this movie in the weeks leading up to the movie, I had listened to the soundtrack over and over again in the lead up. I had predicted almost beat for beat what the opening prologue would be just based on the music cues. Hats off to Howard Shore for painting such a clear picture with music. The only blind spot I had about the content of this film was the audio track An Ancient Enemy. It came after The Unexpected Party but before The Trolls. It sounded big. It sounded dark. I, I I actually speculated that they had transplanted fog on the Barrow Down sequence from Lord of the Rings, in which the four hobbits are captured by ancient ghosts while they're trying to leave the Shire. Geographically, this made sense for the dwarves to pass through, and I thought this was bold. I then, you know, I then watched it. It was Mephisto all along. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I then watched the film, and it was not Fog on the Barrow Downs. Of course it wasn't, John. It was the Battle of Azanul Bazaar, one of my favourite parts of the appendices of Lord of the Rings. I never would have expected to see this battle on the big screen. And here it was. And there was Az... Hmm. Azog the Defiler. Hmm. So, so... So this was Azog. Um, hmm. Not the big beardy guy we'd been shown. In, in fact, I, I was pretty sure I spotted Dwalin kill the big beardy guy in a blink and you'll miss it shot hmm but then again the big beardy guy was bulg now so 
or I don't know. The film went on, hitting most of the beats of the story as expected. I loved it. But all the while, there was this subplot of Azog and Thorin not knowing he's alive. But, I mean, come on, Thorin. You chopped his arm off. You need to see a body. You cannot assume that he is dead. The audience knows this. Gandalf knows this. This just makes Thorin look foolish. Which, I suppose, technically, they could be setting up for his Erebor madness, but... Anyway, Azog finds Thorin and they set the forest on fire and Thorin runs at Azog. This is where the film lost me a little bit, particularly for the music. I'm not the first one to point this out, but this is the Ringwraith theme. This has nothing to do with the Ringwraiths, nothing to do with the Ring, nothing to do with the ancient Numenorians, the corruptibility of the race of men, None of this. It, it, this is, it has nothing to do with anything that we're seeing on screen. They put it here to sound cool. To sound more like Lord of the Rings. Apparently all the text of the music is translated into Dwarvish and refers to Thorin. But we don't understand that. We hear the Ringwraith's music. We hear the Ringwraith's theme. It's completely out of place. And they've done this a few times in the first film, where they have taken music straight out of Lord of the Rings to replace music which they had already written for The Hobbit. This Thorin charge scene had original music, which was Ringwraith-esque, but much more in line with the music of Azanul Bazaar. Which makes sense. Perhaps when this became the climax of film one, instead of the end of act two of film one, they wanted something bigger. It certainly was bigger. I wanted to love this movie. I went to see it in 3D, in 48 frames per second. That, that, that was a weird experience. I will say this though. The arrows flying at Killy uh, when they're down in Goblin Town, down, down, down in Goblin Town, in 3D, 48 frames per second, actually made me flinch. So, you know, well done. Like, I genuinely it went, and I was like, Ooh. well done, well done. Like, yeah. But it looked so weird. Overall, I was. Just, mm. I dissected this film over and over again always coming back to Azog. And where did that design come from? And why it didn't seem right? So much so that I wrote an article about it for the one ring.net. And here it is. You can actually still go and read it. Oh, God. Ah, 2013, you fun year. As 2013 went on, excitement came for film two. The big speculation was, what was Smog gonna look like? Okay, P gonna get this out of the way. I, I call him Smog. Technically, it should be Smog. Sounds weird in my accent, which is why James Nesbitt, who plays Bofer, also pronounced it strangely in relation to his accent. So like, it's it's a diphthong, Tolkien loves his diphthongs, so rather than a blend, so rather than, like you don't say Sauron, you know, it's A-U, you say Sauron. Um, so with that in mind, you, it's Smaug and not Smog, but Smaug sounds really weird in my accent. And you can also, he, so the way James Nesbitt pronounces it is Smaug. You know, that would be a reference to Smaug the Terrible, which is completely out of his accent. It shouldn't be there. It should be. That would be a reference to Smaug the Terrible. But mm, my accent can be thick. Our North of Ireland accents can be thick uh, for um, international audiences, which is fair. But it is also really funny listening to him because you can hear how much he is being very careful with his accent. Like, 
you know, no, that is not a wolf, as opposed to, no, that's not a wolf. You know, <laughs> it's, it's funny. Anyway, so, the speculation was, what is Smog going to look like? Do you know what? I'm just going to call him Smog. I pronounce it whatever the way I want to. So, what was Smog going to look like? Guillermo del Toro had previously said that he was quite happy with putting John Howe's image of Smog straight onto the big screen. And I was super excited about this. This was literally the first image of Tolkien's work I had ever seen. It was on the cover of the book my dad gave me for Christmas 2000 was The Hobbit. In October 2013, I actually carved this image onto a pumpkin and 11 hours of carving later, I emailed it to John Howe himself and he emailed like straight back saying, that is so cool. Do you mind if I share that on Facebook? <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, yeah, sure. Go right ahead. So that was the peak of my pumpkin carving career, I think, you know. I don't want to spend 11 hours ever again carving a pumpkin unless I'm paid for it. <laughs> but it was fun and it was very satisfying and I wish I had gotten, I wish I had gotten a much more high resolution photograph of it, but that's 2013. Earlier that summer, in June, Peter Jackson released a trailer for Desolation of Smoke. And there was a glimpse of smoke. My friends Kelly and Alex of Happy Hobbit, hey guys, did a reaction video to this trailer and, and Peter Jackson shared it on his Facebook page and then shot a reaction of Orlando Bloom, Lee Pace and Evangeline Lilly reacting to their reaction video. It was Hobbitception. It was entertaining. That was a fun summer. In this trailer, we saw Azog arrive at Barrels Out of Bond, at the barrel sequence. When the film came out that December, Azog was nowhere to be seen at the barrel sequence. Bolg was there instead. But Bolg wasn't the big beardy guy. He was another CGI orc with some shared design features of the beardy orc, but obviously not the beard or mane. As it turned out, <laughs> I got so into this. As it turned out, what happened with Bolg and Azog was this. From what I can surmise from production notes and the featurette from the appendices, Azog's initial design, played by Conan Stevens, aka Big Beardy Azog, was present all throughout the filming of the Dol Guldur sequence, which was shot fairly early in production in May 2011. At this point, and I'm speculating here, Azog was supposed to be killed at the Battle of Azanul Bazaar which is sort of true to the book. And he would be raised from the dead by the necromancer. There is a little bit of an undead vibe to this design, but maybe he's just a damn ugly orc. Bjorn was present in these scenes, caged up according to some call sheets and I think a Lego set. The rivalry between Bayorn and Azog was possibly being built because ultimately Bayorn may have killed Azog or Bog, whichever one it was ultimately going to be, at the Battle of the Five Armies, as it was in the book where Bayorn kills Bog. In the book, Azog is killed at the Battle of Azanul Bazaar by Dine Ironfoot. Also, according to the call sheets, Azog kills Thrain, or is it Thrain? I mean, I do I do like da saying Dane and Thrain, but technically I think it should be Thrain, Thrain? Oh, Tolkien, you big old linguist, yeah. It's Sauron that kills Thrain in the extended cut of Desolation of Smog. Smog, Smog, oh my God, pronunciations. 
I always get really annoyed. I always get really annoyed when people mispronounce things in in YouTube videos. And here I am jumping between the two. Uh, did you even watch the film that you're commenting on? There is so much doll Guldur on the cutting room floor. Like, you know that bit where where Galadriel just shows up and she just, poof, you know, like, backs away and he, you know, disintegrates Balg. Or, it's not even Balg anymore, it's just Big Beardy Orc. The uh, Dol Guldur Prison Guard or something like that is his official title now. Um, but there was, like, a whole sequence where she is, like, walking up this kind of causeway and, you know, like, that, that, that action was, like, you know, batting away all sorts of magic being sent her way. It was all very magical. As the production went on, Peter Jackson wasn't quite happy with Azog's design, so he decided to rethink the character, and they redesigned him into an old, kind of rat-faced orc played by John Knowles. By October 2011, they used this design of Azog to shoot the fiery forest scene confronting Thorin. Note, this is while it was still two films. It is assumed here that Big Beardy Azog got reworked as Balg, so all of his Dol Guldur footage could still be used. In April 2012, they shot the Battle of Azanul Bazaar sequence with Wrinkly Azog. One assumes that Big Beardy Azog, now Balg, was included here to still set up the death and resurrection by the Necromancer. I think they wanted to have the Necromancer actually do a little bit of necromancing. It is sometime after this, before additional photography pickup shoots in July, that the decision was made to redesign Azog yet again. You can see from the production diary number 8 that Terry Notary's arc, Yazneg, was being shot. Yazneg shares quite a lot of design qualities from old wrinkly Azog, so I guess that they just recycled certain design elements rather than scrapping the whole thing. During this time, Peter Jackson now knew they were making three films, so it was in these pickups that the new, earlier end of film one was shot with Bilbo's bum rush and, indeed, his rushed character arc. The last day of filming was them on top of the Carrick and Thorin hugging Bilbo. I am convinced that this scene exists almost verbatim shot by the river after the barrel sequence, as this would have been the original ending of film one, and indeed the point in the book where Thorin finally takes Bilbo seriously. August 2012, barely five months from release date, Weta Digital are handed new designs for a digital Azog, with straggly hair, I might add. I wish they had have included that straggly hair, because as a lot of good puppet makers know, adding hair can help breathe more life, weight and realism into your puppet. Although they may have abandoned the hair given the ridiculous turnover and rendering time for these shots. Manu Bennett was then in a mocap suit that August shooting his scenes, and given the circumstances, he did a damn good job. Having solved most of this mystery myself in 2013, I was hilariously surprised to see Big Beardy Azog slash Balg Dol Guldur prison guard dude show up in the briefest of brief moments in film 3 getting obliterated by Galadriel. He has a little more footage in the extended edition, but not much. Why have I been outlining all of this? I suppose I'm trying to establish how much this Dol Guldur storyline changed over the production, and also you can see how they developed the desire to not lock down any orc designs for film 3 while on set, allowing them to design them later in post-production. And also, I've been sitting on this stuff for years, like Charlie Day and his conspiracy board, so I just had to share it!
this one thread was one in several which tangled into the tumultuous production of The Hobbit, forcing the creators into making three films. I have always wanted to see the two films which we were promised. So, yeah, I made a duology cut of The Hobbit. Duologies are quite a rarity in film. The structure of a trilogy is just too damn tempting for many as an epic storyteller. There's a certain trifecto power structure to a trilogy, which in many ways mirrors the classic three-act structure present in most popular films. Film 1 stands on its own, tells its own story, establishes its own world, Film 2 adds complexity, brings it to darker places, and Film 3 brings it all together, ups the ante, recontextualizes the first film, and brings the story to a hopefully satisfying end. Duologies rarely happen. Many long-standing film duologies, such as Ghostbusters and Bill and Ted, have gone down the route of having third films, which I have not seen yet. But many stand still such as Airplane, Finding Nemo, and Finding Dory, although they'll probably make other ones down the line. Hellboy, although Guillermo del Toro intended this to be a trilogy, so... Hey look, it's Guillermo del Toro again. Blade Runner and Train Spotting stand as duologies, but, but there's nothing saying they'll remain that way when Hollywood wants to cash in on another nostalgia check. They won't be cashing checks, don't be silly. Who cashes checks anymore? The duology that stands out for me, however, is, of course, Kill Bill. The roaring rampage of revenge. The funny thing is, this is an accidental duology. It was written as one film, shot as one film, but upon editing the huge amount of footage, Tarantino was told... By Harvey Weinstein. God damn it. Why does he keep showing up? Ugh, you terrible person. So Harvey Weinstein was the producer and he told Tarantino that he was to cut it into two films. And Tarantino ultimately embraced the structure and described it as a question and an answer. Volume 1 asks all the questions and Volume 2 gives all the answers. This idea of a call and response really sat with me as an interesting storytelling structure and I was interested to see how this would apply to The Hobbit. Upon re-cutting the Now Trilogy back into two films, I discovered there were some lovely little call and responses within the films, such as the mirroring scenes between Bilbo and Bofur, both times Bofur catching Bilbo about to sneak off but both characters having changed immensely since that first scene. There are also some lovely little internal setups and payoffs which got split up when turned into a trilogy, such as the setup of Bilbo's sword not having a name, and in the third act of that same film, he names it Sting, as opposed to act one of the next film. As one film became two, and two films became three, this video, as was intended to be one, is now two. So join me next time for the changes I made, the rearrangements I made, reinstating unused musical score, and more. Check it out, it's gonna be good. So be sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon, you can support my work on patreon.com forward slash John D. Ruddy. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, where else? Loads of places. I'm on TikTok. Loads of places. Go and follow me. And uh, and keep an eye out for part two. Which, there's not going to be a part three. There's, there's not going to be a third one. There's, there's not. Apparently. I hope. I'll, prob I'll probably revisit this. I'll, I'll re-edit this again in like ten years. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> Bye.